Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in John uh, chapter 7-ish, 8 and 9. Uh, but John, if you have your Bibles, <clears throat> uh, I want to look at one of the names of God this morning, which is uh, this idea of the light of the world. And uh, just been pondering this idea just a fresh over the last several days, and it's been really just wonderfully rich in my life. I want to give you a quick quote just to kind of maybe set the stage, and then we'll dive into this. Uh, this is what one author said about this idea of light. According to Jewish tradition, one of the names for the Messiah is light. So how fitting then that Jesus is called the light of the world. Uh, have you ever been in one of those places of like total, absolute darkness? And it, you really don't, we can't do it just at nighttime, right? Because there's still moonlight and there's so much lights in the cities that we don't have true darkness. But have you ever gone caving uh, or, you know, like underground or something like that and actually had true pitch blackness? Uh, one of the things or one of the places we go to uh, when we take groups over to Israel is we always go through Hezekiah's tunnel. And if you know the story of Hezekiah, it's an incredible feat of just engineering. In fact, they uh, hear the, uh, I think it was the Assyrians that were coming in, they're going to they surround Israel, uh, surround Jerusalem. And so Hezekiah begins to build this tunnel and he starts on two ends and they meet in the middle. And they're only like, I think it was like a foot off. I mean, it was just, it was, it was mind boggling, uh, just the engineering feat of this whole thing. So they can get the water from the Gion Spring over to the Pool of Siloam. Uh, anyway, we, we usually walk through this waterway and the water still runs and, you know, you're sloshing around and, and usually halfway through the tunnel, uh, I always stop the crowd, you know, stop the whole crew and just say, all right, uh, this is going to be a little awkward, but uh, we're going to turn off the lights. And uh, so the last couple times we've gone, we, we walk a section of the tunnel completely blind. And I don't know if you've ever been in those kind of places, but it is so dark, you cannot see your hand in front of your face. I mean, it is, it is like heavy darkness. And so we're, we're walking along uh, through, the, through Hezekiah's tunnel. We're making our way over to the Pool of Siloam. And I think it's actually really fascinating even because in our story today, in John chapter 9, Jesus, you know, makes this mud with, with his spit and puts it upon this blind man's face and says, I want you to go down to the pool of Siloam, wash it off, and you'll be healed. And so I use it as almost as a, as a metaphor or a story, an illustration, that as we're walking the, the Hezekiah's tunnel thing, we are, being, we are blind. And you don't know where the tunnel's going, so you're, you're filling around, you don't know how tall the ceiling is, and so you're bumping around and Bouncing on it. I mean, it's just, it's delightfully horrible. And at some point, you know, we, we walk for a few minutes. And then I say, okay, let's turn the lights on. And it, there's a palatable, oh, that happens when the light turns on. There's something interesting about light, isn't it? That, that you could be in the midst of this darkness. Uh, you could have this fearful moment. But the moment the lights turn on, there actually is a peace. And, and there's a calm. And there's clarity. And there's focus. I find it intriguing to me that God is known as light. That in him is peace. In him is refuge. In him is a calm. In him is clarity. In him is hope. So I want to flesh that out a little bit this morning. Uh, here's what that same author continued to say. She wrote, The Hebrew scriptures are full of images that link God with light. Pillars of fire, burning lamps, consuming fire, such images are often associated with God's nearness or his presence. John's gospel portrays Jesus as the embodiment of the divine light, a light so powerful that it cannot be overcome by the darkness of sin and death. And then think about this as the opposite. Though Satan tries to disguise himself as an angel of light, he is light's opposite. He's actually the prince of darkness. It's an intriguing theme that weaves itself all through Scripture. In fact, you see this at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, where God is speaking in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the chaos, and God says, let there be light. And there was light. And what's interesting is when you take this idea of the fact that God spoke light in the midst of darkness at the very beginning, if you fast forward into the eternal stuff, Isaiah brings this prophecy and says this, and Isaiah 60, verse 19, no longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor the brightness will the moon give you light. 
But you will have, think about this, you will have Yahweh for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. And so Isaiah is given this prophecy saying, do you realize there, there's coming a day when actually we won't even need the light because Yahweh himself will be the light. That his very nature and character is light. It shines forth in the midst of darkness. And of course, in the book of Revelation, we see the declaration or the fruition of this where it says in Revelation 22, verse 5, that we're talking about the eternal stuff, that there will no longer be any night and they will not have need of the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God, again, this is going back to the Isaiah prophecy, the Lord God will illuminate them and they will reign forever and ever. Not a great thought that when we get into the new heavens and the new earth, there's going to be no need for a sun or a moon or the stars. Why? Because the very presence of Jesus is going to be the light itself. He is light. And he is going to shine forth light. That's an amazing thought. As you work through the Old Testament, you start to see this theme repeated. This idea that the light is often associated with, uh, or as, uh, as an essential descriptor of the being and the very character of God. So let me just give you a few passages here. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of Yahweh has risen upon you. And you start to get this idea that light and the very person of God are tied together and, and they're, they're associated with each other. Or look at this, Psalm 36, verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Psalm 27, 1. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is a strong defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Job in Job 29 says this, Oh, that I were as in the months gone by, as in the days when God kept me, when his lamp shone over my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. Or Daniel 2 verse 22, Daniel says that the light dwells with him. Or Micah 7 verse 8, do not be glad over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I inhabit the darkness, think about this, Yahweh is a light for me. So you have this thread or this thought that throughout the Old Testament, the very person of God and light is associated. Uh, then you have all this imagery, right? You have the pillar of, uh, pillar of fire. You know, you, you have these images that begin to show up of light, 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 light. Now, all this comes to a head then in the New Testament when Jesus, who is Yahweh in the flesh, <clears throat> declares himself and shows himself as light. Let me just give you a few passages. Uh, in terms of prophecy of the coming Messiah, Isaiah 42 says this, <clears throat> Behold my servant, speaking of the Messiah, whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom my soul is well pleased, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. I am Yahweh, and I have called you in righteousness. I will also take hold of you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you as a covenant to the people. He's speaking, speaking of the Messiah. I will give you as a light to the nations to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and, to, and those who inhabit darkness from the prison. God says, do you know what the Messiah is going to do? Do you, do you know what... When I come in the flesh, I am going to be a light to the nations. I am the light of the world. Isn't that a great prophecy? Jesus is the light. Or in Isaiah 9:2, Isaiah says, The people who walked in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them. And so as Jesus shows up on the scene, look at what what Paul says about Jesus in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, light shall shine out of the darkness, is the very one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Uh, this is very apparent in the book of John. John, in the beginning of his gospel, says this, in him was life, speaking of Jesus, and the life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overtake it. In other words, there, there's no ability for the darkness to consume or overpower light. Light always wins. And, that, and that's a great encouragement to me. 
I walk into a room and the lights are off. Do you realize when I flip the switch, I don't go, hmm, I wonder who's going to win this time. That, that's, that's a, I, it's not even a thought in your head. Why? Because the light always wins. Darkness is merely the absence of light. And so the moment I flip on the light, darkness has to flee. And so John is saying, hey, look, do you not realize that here is Jesus and in him was life and that life was the light of men and that light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not overtake it. There was a man having been sent from God whose name was John, speaking of John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. There was the true light, which, speaking of Jesus, coming into the world enlightens everyone. Jesus is light. I remember that beautiful scene where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And of course, he says in you know, verse 14 and 15 that the serpent will be lifted up. And just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness with Moses, so I will be lifted up. And then he gives John 3, 16. But right after all of that, Jesus says this in John 3, verse 19. He says, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. And I don't, I don't want to get distracted with the passage, but it's really intriguing to me that what Jesus says is, do you realize that humanity has this insatiable, overwhelming, unconditional love for sin? And awkwardly, he uses, Jesus uses the word agape, agape, for love. And we often use it in the sense of God's love, and that is the primary way it's used throughout Scripture. But you realize it's this aggressive, unconditional, unrelenting kind of a love. And so Jesus says, do you recognize humanity has this, I don't care what sin does to me. I don't care what death it brings in my life. I don't care what it does. I'm not letting go of my sin. Why? I just love my sin. My deeds are evil. And there's such a wickedness in our heart. We don't care what sin does to us. We don't care what destruction it causes. I refuse to let go of my sin. It's an unconditional love for our sin. And Jesus says, Here, here's the judgment. I've come into the world as light. And yet, have you ever noticed that light can be offensive? I don't know if you've ever done this when you've gone camping. Probably shouldn't do this. But it is delightful. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's, it's getting late at night and everyone's eyes have adjusted to the darkness and you're enjoying the stars. And you take your flashlight and, and without someone knowing, you walk up behind them, you're like, hey, just got a quick question. And they turn their head, and right as they turn, you shine the, the flashlight in their face. And if you get like one of those big flashlights, like it's, it's even better, right? But you turn on the light, and it's, there's so much brightness that it actually becomes offensive. In fact, if you don't be careful, they'll, they'll hit you. <laughs> I've still got a bruise. Uh, just kidding. But there's this, there is this confrontation with light. There, there's actually an offense. Listen to what Jesus is saying. I have come into the world, and the world is so full of darkness that humanity has so loved their sin and their evil and their, 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 deeds are, their, their deeds are so wicked that I have come into the world, and they've refused to embrace light. Why? Because they actually see the light as the problem. They've seen light as that which is causing problems in their darkness, that it's actually offensive to how they're living. And they would actually rather choose the darkness, regardless of what sin does in their life, rather than walking in the reality of, of light. And folks, that is our culture. That is our world today. And we need to pray that God would stir and awaken their hearts, that they would actually be softened, their eyes would be awakened to light. Because light has come into the world. And unfortunately, the light has rejected, sorry, the world has rejected the light. Why? Because they've embraced their darkness. Yeah, but their darkness is killing them. I know. Just like the darkness in your soul kills you. So why do, why do you keep going back to it? Well, I really like my darkness. What would it be neat if you had the light invade every crevice of your soul and remove every shadow area. 
Well, it's going to be painful. I know. But that's what we need, isn't it? So all that kind of builds to John chapter 7. And again, this theme of light and dark is found just over and over in John's writings. In John, and 1 John especially, Revelation, you, you have this light-dark thing going on. And I even find this interesting. If you look at the entire story of Scripture, do you realize that the entire Bible is a progression of going from dark unto light? That, that what you see in, in Genesis 1-3, when God speaks light into the mix of darkness, that actually becomes a major theme for the entirety of this book. Because in Genesis chapter 3, what does humanity do? Well, they chose their darkness. Their deeds were wicked, right? They chose sin. And what do you see going from Genesis 3 all the way through the book of Revelation? You actually see this progression of going from darkness, from sin, into and unto light and salvation. And it's actually a beautiful picture of what God is doing. So, so just as God spoke light in the midst of darkness, guess what he's doing in Scripture? He's bringing humanity from darkness into light. What is he doing in my own soul with the gospel? Well, he's looking in the chaos of my darkness, of my soul, and the one who is light, Jesus, is being spoken and brought into the reality of my life, and light is separated from the darkness. Or I should say it this way, when light comes into my life, darkness has to leave. It is a picture of the gospel. Isn't that incredible? So again, it all comes ahead then in John chapter 7, when Jesus, and this shows up in chapter 8, but the context is 7, 8, 9. When Jesus stands up and says, I am the light. Not that he has light. He is the light. Uh, the context for this whole scene is uh, John chapter 7. And in John chapter 7, you have this feast that is going on. It's a fall feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also called the Feast of Booths. Uh, the official name is Sukkot. Uh, it's an eight-day feast that happens between mid-September and mid-October. Just depending on the year, it kind of moves around a little bit. And what's really interesting, and we're not going to have time to get into the feast itself, and so you, you, you need to probably go study the feast. Uh, but... What ends up happening on, during the feast is that during this eight-day celebration of Sukkot, the, the festival, the booths, or the tents, and you know the, the, that idea, the tabernacling thing, is that in the time of Jesus, the priests would every evening light these four massive menorahs, these, these candelabras, this, these lights in, in the court of the, court of the women of the temple. And the reports are from from outside of scripture, but the reports were that these menorahs, that these candlesticks, that these lights were so massive, think, think how crazy this is, that you had, here's Jerusalem on a hill, they had these four massive menorahs in the outer courts, and the light was so bright that it lit up the entire city. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to do. That just seems crazy to me. It's like you have these massive spotlights that are, or these l lamps that are just lighting up the entirety of, of a city because they're here. Now, in the context of all of this, which, which is what you see in chapter 7, <clears throat> as you come into chapter 8, Jesus, in the midst of this festival, gives us incredible declaration. And Jesus stands up in the, in the middle of this feast, and this is what he says. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I, I love the fact that Jesus is using the things around him as a portrayal of himself. Uh, that as, as he was teaching, he would use the, the, you know, the field stuff or he'd use the farming stuff or the fishing stuff. And, and here's Jesus in the middle of the, the Feast of Tabernacles. These massive candelabras or these menorahs were being lit. It was lighting up the entire city. It was light in the midst of darkness. And Jesus, in the, in the middle of this eight-day feast, stands up and says, do you know who I am? I am that light in the midst of darkness. I, I, I am. And by the way, that phrase, I am, is the same construction of what Moses got at the burning bush in the Old Testament. In essence, what Jesus is saying is, 
I am the light. That Yahweh is light itself. And Jesus is, is tying himself to the fact that he is Yahweh in the flesh. And what's really, really neat in, in the Greek is that that phrase, I am the light, and, and by the way, all seven times Jesus gives the I am statements uh, in, in the book of John, they're all in the present tense, which is, which is super exciting because when you understand how the Greek present tense works, it's not that it's like the present tense for right now, it's probably better understood as the ever present tense. So whenever it is present, this is the reality. So Jesus stands up and says, you know who I am? I am Yahweh in the flesh, and I am right now and forever will be light. And Jesus is tying himself with this Old Testament picture that God is light, that he's light in the midst of darkness, that he is the light of the world, that when he shows up, darkness has to flee. Now, as you follow in chapter 8 down through, and we're not going to read it, but if you, if you were to read chapter 8, what you begin to realize is that the Pharisees and Jesus start having this conversation back and forth, and the Pharisees are all frustrated, and they're all just get you know, they're been out of shape. And uh, several times, Jesus makes these statements equating himself with Yahweh of the Old Testament. He says, I am that God, that God I have come in the flesh. And of course, by the end of the chapter, they're picking up stones and they're about to kill him. Why? Because Jesus has clearly defined and clarified that he is God himself, which is phenomenal. Jesus is Yahweh. And if you, uh, if you jump down to verse 30, look, look at what Jesus says here. In verses 30 through 32 of chapter 8, it says that as he was speaking these things, many believed in him. Now ponder this. You, we're not talking the Pharisees. We're talking, we're talking the people. So they're hearing all of this, and there's this group of people who are saying, wow, I believe. Hey, I'm putting my faith in you, Jesus, that you are who you say you are. And look at this. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, if you just remain, if you just rest, if you just sink down into what I'm saying, then you truly are my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Have you ever pondered this? That here we are in humanity, and we are full of darkness. Our deeds are evil. How are we going to get out of that? How on earth are we going to get out of our darkness and out of our addictions and out of our sin and out of our selfishness and, and out of the self-focus? And do you realize what you need is a light? Light to invade your darkness. And Jesus says, man, if you would just believe me, if you would just embrace this whole thing, if you would just sink down into and abide and remain and just rest in my words, then you will be my disciples. And if I can use it in the context because I am light, I will set you free from the darkness. That is, Jesus says in the passage, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Truth sets you free from lies. Light sets you free from darkness. And Jesus, in the middle of this feast, stands up and says, I am the light. And if you would just remain in me, if you would just, just sink down into my words, I promise you, you will be my disciples and I will set you free. Well, Jesus, I, I have all these shadow areas in my life. Jesus, I have all these little sin crevices. Jesus, I'll handle it because I'm the light and I'm going to invade your life and I will not allow a single area to be hidden. Everything's going to be exposed. Everything's going to come to light. But in so doing, yeah, there might be a little bit of pain, but in so doing, it'll set you free. Isn't that incredible? I want that, don't you? Now, that's chapter 8. As you move into chapter 9, Jesus is still in the Feast of the Tabernacles. As you move in, in, into chapter 9, you have this incredible story, and we're not going to dive deep into this, but there's this incredible story about this man who was born blind. So in John chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he would be born blind. Now, again, they're using a Jewish cultural thing where they presumed that if you had an, a physical ailment, it's probably because of sin. And we're not going to get into all that, but 
But Jesus, I find this so interesting that John puts this, it's just right smack at the back of chapter eight. Do you realize that throughout chapter eight, you have Jesus and the Pharisees arguing back and forth. And the Pharisees are saying, look, we know the law. Hey, we see it clearly. Hey, we understand what's going on. We know Moses. We know Abraham. We, what they're declaring is we have the light. We see, hey, we see this. This makes complete sense to us. And you're saying these things, and we don't see that. So think about the contrast. Jesus, in chapter 8, stands up and says, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees are like, we have the light. So the Pharisees are arguing that Jesus is actually dark. And Jesus stands up as the light and says, <clears throat> uh, actually, you guys are blind. You guys are walking in darkness. You think you have light, but what you actually have is darkness. And coming right out of that, Jesus sees a blind man. And the disciples go, whose problem is that? And Jesus sets them straight and goes, get off that. It's, it's not his fault. It wasn't his parents' fault. And then Jesus makes this statement in verse 5. He says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, ponder this. As you follow that story through, Jesus heals the man, right? Puts, spits on the ground, puts the mud on his face, go down to the pool of Siloam. So he's traveling down, and there's a whole, I think there's like 400 steps from the Temple Mount area down to the pool of Siloam. And so he's probably bumping along, and he finally gets there, he washes his face. Woo! He is healed. He runs back. Now, just so happens, Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. And so the Pharisees are up in the arms, and so they, they start questioning the guy. Hey, who healed you? I don't know. But I, what I know is I was blind, now I see. And so they call the parents in. Was your son actually blind? And of course, the parents were afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue, and so they, they said, like, he's old enough, ask him. Right? Well, all we know is that he was born, he was born blind, and now he can see. How? We have no idea. And so there's this big argument. And I, I love the scene halfway through chapter 9 where they, they bring the guy back in and says, tell us, who healed you? And the guy goes, I've told you already. Are you wanting to be his disciples too? <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. And they get all bent out of shape. Ah, we're Moses' disciples. Hey, we're sons of Abraham. Do you know what they're declaring? We have the light. And, and they, they start accusing him. Yeah, you might be able to see now, but you're actually still blind. Isn't this an interesting, there is a irony that's happening in this story purposely where here are the religious leaders. Here is the religious elite and they are confident they have something and Jesus says, you're actually blind. And the one who's actually blind is the one who can actually see. And Jesus in the middle of all this says, and I'm the light. Can I, just as a side, pressing and encouragement, do you realize that if you're grabbing a hold of anything other than Jesus, you may think you have light, but you're walking in darkness? Well, yeah, but I grew up in the church. And I, I know, hey, I know all the regulations. And, and, and this is what we're supposed to do. And this is supposed to how we're doing it. Da, 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 da. Fine. But you're embracing darkness because it's something other than Jesus. Well, I've got my traditions, and this is how we've always done it, and this is a fine. But unless you grab a hold of Jesus, who is the light itself, according to Jesus, you're blind. Does that make any sense? Well, yeah, but I'm a Pharisee. I obey the law. I mean, I just I, I keep I keep all the rules. Fine, but you're blind. Because the only thing that gets you out of the blindness is a person. His name is Jesus. Because he is the light. So can I encourage us as, as the church of today, let, let's not grab a hold of our little traditions. It's not that tradition is bad and evil, folks. But when I make this more important than Jesus, I become blind. And what Jesus wants to do is have me embrace him. So that even if I am blind, I, be, I gain my sight. Uh, really quickly, uh, when you look at this idea of light, 
Let me just give you five quick ideas or some practical application with light. Again, we could go on forever with all this stuff, but just practically this morning, what does it mean for God to be light? What does it mean for him, his, one of his names, to be the light of the world? That he doesn't just merely have light, he is light. Let me just give you five quick ideas. Number one, do you realize that light reveals impurity? Light is amazing that you, you go into a room and even if there are shadows, you turn on the light and it reveals everything. It reveals the corner. The, it reveals the cracks. I don't know if you ever cleaned your house and you, know, you clean your house and then you open the curtains and you're like, seriously, I just cleaned the house. And it's like suddenly you see things that you miss. You, you see that streak on the coffee table that you thought you wiped off and there's like this line of dust. And you're like, oh. You see the streaks in the window. You clean the window, but somehow now that there's light on the window, you see all the streaks in the window. Wouldn't it be neat if Jesus as the light could come in and reveal all the impurities of our, of our heart? That we're, we're not measuring ourselves against the culture. Because if I measure myself against the culture, I'm doing fairly well. But if I measure myself against the perfect standard of light, a lot of impurities revealed. So I need Jesus, who not only reveals the impurities, but then purifies the impurities. But light reveals impurity. And we need God, search and try my heart, O oh Lord. See if there's any wickedness within me. Hey, take your light and emblazon it upon my life and see if there's any wickedness. See if there's any evil. Is there anything that doesn't look like Jesus? Reveal that in my life. Number two, not only does light reveal impurity, but it also provides protection. I love the story of the Israelites and they're, they're, they've left Egypt and they're running from Pharaoh and they get to the Red Sea and God, in a pillar of fire, stands between Egypt and and Israel to give them time to cross the Red Sea. Do you realize that the light, the fire of God, and it really is symbolic of the very presence of God, do you realize that it gave protection? That as, if you remember the story, right, they're wandering the wilderness, and, and I'll just give this next one too because they're tied together, but it gives direction. Uh, in, in Exodus 13, it says that Yahweh was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them on the way and a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they may go by day and by night. Or as Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. <clears throat> Do you realize that light gives direction? That, that light gives protection. Think how cool this is. Do you realize that when they were wandering the wilderness, it's a desert, which means in the, in the day, it's scorching hot. So God is a pillar of cloud that gives shade. But at night, if you've ever been in the desert, it gets super cold. So what does God do? He becomes a pillar of fire, which doesn't just give light. It also gives warmth. So when you have this idea of light, in the Old Testament, it's this idea of direction. We follow the fire. We follow the light, right? The word of God is a lamp, right? We follow the word. But it also is a protection thing. It gives us comfort. It gives us hope. It gives us, because he is, the, he is that light. He is that fire that we warm ourselves in the coolness of night. Uh, number four, again, it goes to this idea that it supplies hope and, and refuge. Uh, if, if, if you... Uh, have you ever had this, like, you're in your house and the lights are off and suddenly you hear a noise and you're like, I'm, that doesn't sound good. What do you do? Well, a logical person turns on the lights. And it is amazing, isn't it? That the moment a light is turned on, you're like, oh, I'm fine. Why is it that kids need a nightlight? Well, because I'm scared. But if I just have a little bit of the light... Uh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm doing okay. So look at your roommate and just say, it's going to be okay. I'm glad you brought your nightlight in the shape of a butterfly, right? Or whatever, right? But, but, but it, gives, it gives hope and it gives, it gives security. It gives rest. It gives peace. And, and lastly, do you realize that 
light is associated with life. And this is really clear in John, but in, in John chapter 1, in him, in Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. Or as 1 John says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Do you realize what we need in our life is light? Not just the light from a sun, not just light from a lamp. We need the God of the universe who is light to be light in us. That, that he would reveal those impurities, that, that he would lead and guide and direct and give security and hope and refuge. and That he would actually, the one who is light, would actually be the life that we desperately need. Can I encourage you? Don't walk in darkness. Don't live in your sin. Nor like the Pharisees, be so religious and so focused on the duties and the obligations that you miss what all that pointed to, which was the light. And in thinking I was doing the right thing, I actually embraced darkness and I became blind when Jesus is standing right in front of me saying, here I am. Will you just embrace the light? And the phenomenal news is, if you are blind, if you're walking in darkness, whether it is sin or whether it is whatever it may be, do you realize that Jesus is the solution? That if you're blind, he'll spit on the mud and put it on your face and he will cleanse you and you will see. If you're walking in darkness and your deeds are evil and, and there's just wickedness in your life, do you know what you need? You need God to speak light in the midst of your darkness and let Jesus be the light of your life. If you've been a believer for years and years and years and you're like, man, I just need Jesus, well, would you just, would you be open? Would you seek, would you desire the God of the universe to invade every crevice of your soul and to search and try your heart and point out anything, even if it's just a speck of dust that doesn't belong? Lord, cleanse me, purify me. We need light. And maybe it's just one other quick practical. I love the thought that in Matthew chapter 5, do you know what Jesus called his disciples? Lights. There are lights on a hill. They're a lamp that is not covered. And do, do note the difference. In the book of Revelation, the church is called the lampstand. We are not the light itself. That's Jesus. We are not the light, but we're the ones that bear the light. We're the ones that carry the light. And do you realize that you have the overwhelming privilege of being the one that is so full of light that when you live your life out in this world, when, when, when you are going down to your job or your school or you're living in your family or you go to your church, do you realize what's supposed to happen is that the one who is light is to be seen in and through your life so that your life becomes a miniature light. You're not the light, but your life becomes the vessel, the, the lamp, uh, the, the lampstand, the candlestick, whatever the language you want to use is, the torch holder, piece of wood, whatever that's called, the flashlight, whatever it is, right? Like whatever you want to call it, but, but you are the bearer. You are the one that holds the light. You're not the light, but what would it look like in your world if you would allow the one who is light to shine himself through you and bring light to this very dark world? Our world needs light. And Jesus wants to use us as his image bearers to bring light to this world. I am not the light, but is it possible that I could be so filled with the light that when the world sees my life, they don't see me, they see him. And somehow they just say, I, I need, I need light. I need Jesus. Uh, Lord, we need you. 
Lord, we don't want something from you. We just want you. And Lord, would you be light in our lives? Lord, if we have shadow areas, if we're walking in sin and darkness, Lord, I pray that you would shine your light and you would radically transform the areas of darkness into areas of light. Lord, if we're walking as blind, blind people, thinking we may be in the light, Lord, would you just, through your incredible way, would you reveal truth and would you stir our hearts and, and allow us to walk in humility and, and may we see the fact that we are actually blind and what we need is you. And Lord, what an incredible privilege we have in this world to be the ones that get to carry the light. And so a world who thinks that they're doing just fine, but yet their deeds are evil and they've rejected the light and it's offensive, Lord, would you, would you so shine your face, shine your life in and through us? And Lord, we realize if they hated you, they'll probably hate us. If light was offensive back then, it's still offensive now. But oh Lord, that you would stir this world and that you would captive, capture and captivate it, that you would cause a revival to stir in our generation because a whole bunch of little lights on a hill that the darkness cannot overcome would somehow cause on a blaze that would just... Whew. Lord, we just thank you that you are light and in you is no darkness at all. And that is the very thing you're wanting to produce in us. Light. Where there's no areas of shadow. We love you. Let's give you the praise and the glory in your precious name. Amen.